Welcome to episode 159 of the Monday Morning Critic. Today's guest is Academy Award winning editor Paul Hirsch. Paul's filmography includes Star Wars A New Hope for which he won his Academy Award, The Empire Strikes Back, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Mission Impossible, Carrie, Ray, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Footloose, Source Code. I mean, I don't think I've had a guest on the show that's been this good for this long. I mean, Paul's work is still in high demand. He is one of, if not the best, editors working today. And to be that good, as I mentioned, over a span of 50 years is pretty amazing. Uh, Speaking of 50 years, Paul's experiences, his accomplishments, many of which can be found in his new book, A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away, My 50 Years of Editing Hollywood Hits, Star Wars, Carrie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Mission Impossible, and more. That is available anywhere books are sold, you know, Amazon, uh, iTunes, uh, Barnes & Noble, anywhere books are sold. And you hear Paul will talk about that during the interview. You'll also hear me mangle the title of that book. I called it a long, long time ago, and I have Star Wars engraved in my brain with The Rise of Skywalker nearly a month away, only a month away, I should say. So I, I'm pretty excited to have Paul on. Um, for those of you listening, uh, welcome to the Monday Morning Critic podcast. You could find me on Instagram at Monday Morning Critic. You could find me on Twitter at MDM Critic. My website, where I post all the interviews since day one, is mmcpodcast.com. Again, that is mmcpodcast.com. And, you know, if you forget all of this, you could just simply Google Monday Morning Critic Podcast and there are links everywhere to get more of this interview and other interviews. So without further ado, please welcome Academy Award winning editor Paul Hirsch. My next guest is an Academy Award winning editor. His book, A Long, Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away, My 50 Years of Editing Hollywood Hits, Star Wars, Carrie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Mission Impossible, so many more. I can go on. Ray, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Please welcome Paul Hirsch. Paul, thanks for coming on the podcast today. I hope your day is well. My pleasure. So, I mean, there's with the history you have, it's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm going through some of the people you've worked for, uh, John Hughes, Brian De Palma, George Lucas. Um, is, is it fair to say that Brian De Palma is your mentor? I mean, I've heard you say it on occasion. Is that a fair a, a statement to make? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and I and there's so much to your career, so I don't want to jump too far ahead of, ahead of myself. But you know, just going through your filmography, and I, you know, there's tons that that I've mentioned, but there's also work that you've had that I haven't heard in interviews, but you've I think you've contributed on like World War Z, The Great Gatsby, Life of Pi. How does that work, Paul? Do you just have a little bit of an influence? You do some work in that film, and you're not like the leading editor. How, how does that work? Why why aren't you credited for? the same way you are in some of your other works. Um, right. Well, each film is an individual case. So, but usually it's, it's a picture that the studio for whatever reason has some concerns about. And, um, they say, uh, would you mind either looking at it and giving us notes or would you mind, uh, coming in for a few weeks or, uh, it's phrased, you know, differently, but, um, there comes a point very frequently that, uh, on a picture where you've been working for many months that the director and the editor, and maybe even the studio executives and the producers sort of get what I call snow blind and they're not sure what they're looking at anymore. Cause it's, they've been working on it so long and they don't have an objective take on, on what's there. And they like to bring in, excuse me, they like to bring in what they call fresh eyes. And um, sometimes it's just watching the picture and giving notes. And sometimes it's actually um, sitting down and and doing a version. Um, So that's how, you know, and then I find that uh, not taking a credit is a way to make my suggestions more tolerable that I'm not trying to, um, you know, hog credit from someone. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Yeah. You know, so that the suggestions go down easily, more easily because they're offered as genuine, you know, uh, efforts to help. 
and, and I have a question down the road that's that's on this topic, but I'm, I'll ask you now because it's just it's, it's appropriate at this point. Do you find that studio executives, as time goes by, are I don't want to say the word meddling because that has a negative connotation to it. But do you find that their involvement is more where the work should probably be left to those in the creative process, director, writer, editor? Is it is it more intrusive as time goes by, Paul? Um, well, I'll say this, that the most successful films that I've worked on have been the product of my collaboration with the director. So mm. essentially just the two of us. Um, making the decisions about the cut. No, that's well said. And, and you know, I, I do want to talk a little bit about your early life. So you grew up in Paris. How many years were you in Paris for, Paul? I was in Paris as a child for about four years. Now, are you, do you still, can you, are you fluent in French? Can you still speak it? Is it something you... Uh, I'm fluent. Uh, my accent is very good. I'm fluent to the degree... Uh, well, I shouldn't say I'm fluent. I I, I always uh, impress French speakers by the quality of my accent, but I hurry, I hasten to tell them that my vocabulary is very small, and uh, you know I I don't have a real facility because I use it so seldom. But I'm sure if I went over there and spent two or three months in total immersion, I'd, I'd get back to where I had been. You know, yeah, of course where I, had been, where, I, where I had been was. A, when I was eight, I left there when I was eight years old. So I have the vocabulary of an eight-year-old child. But uh, you know, I think I, I think if I stayed there, I would pick it up better. You know. Yeah, that's certainly fluent in my book. Um, and then you were, you know, your dad's a painter, and, and and I have to believe you get some of his his eye for things. And you know, art history major. You're the second art history major I've had in I think what, two weeks, which is which is telling because I feel like history major, Paul. She was she's a costume designer. You're an editor. I feel like history, majoring in history gives you a, this supreme eye for details. Is that kind of going overboard, or, or do you think there's something to that? Um, I really don't know one way or the other. Um, I'm an art, I was an art history major, not a history major. There's a distinction there. Right. Um, as, yeah, as, I, as was she. As was she. She was also an art history major. So it was like, yeah, she – go ahead. I'm sorry, but – In my case – uh, as an art history major, you spend a lot of times looking at projected images in dark rooms and and critiquing them. So uh, I was sort of being prepared for a lifetime of work doing just that. Although I wound up doing moving images instead of still ones, but um, I think my background is you know was useful in terms of developing an aesthetic about uh, the elements of of uh, style in visual arts and there are many qualities that you you know you you try to achieve um you know, whether it's you know a symmetry or balance or uh, grace or um you know certain aesthetic qualities that you strive for that are not necessarily only in the visual arts, too, because I majored in music uh, in high school. I went to the High School of Music and Art. And so uh, my work in film, I find uh, very closely tied to my feelings about music. And then for me, music is an essential element of my work in terms of uh, making presentations, whether it's to the director or to the public or whatever, you know, uh, music is an essential ingredient in what I'm doing. Yeah, that's well said. And, and, you know, people that are listening to this podcast, many see editors and they think they know what an editor's job is, but many times it's a team involvement. Many times you're working in collaboration, as you mentioned, with a director. How would you, what's your Cliff Notes version of, of what an editor is for those listening and probably aren't sure exactly what it is? How would you define an editor's job? Well, I can read to you from the introduction to my book, which is essentially a chapter devoted to answering exactly that question. Um, but uh, that would take a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. And I have to say, I, I have it ordered on Amazon, and I did read an excerpt. I think it was on Entertainment Magazine or Entertainment Weekly. It was a really beautiful excerpt they printed. 
Yeah. Um, and, and people said some really nice things. I mean, Mark Campbell talking about how movies are made in the editing room and um, there's so much of, of your book I want to get into. It's it's really an amazing uh, it's an amazing story. Your life is there's been so much to it. Um, you're yeah. you're in- essentially what the editor is doing is uh, putting together the experience that the audience is going to have, and everything that's done on a film, whether it's the writers, the actors, the cinematographers, the production designers, the costume designers, the makeup people, the hair people. Everything that all their work is um, toward one end, and that's to provide the editor with raw materials. Everything they do is in service of the cut, and um, the editor takes everything that they have done and uses it to build the experience that the audience is going to have. Yeah, and do you find as as you? I mean, because you've been so effective for so long. I mean, that's a testament to your abilities. But you know, do you find that much of your your work is 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 with the directors? Do you find that a lot of it is? You know, I know George had faith in you clearly. Um, Brian has faith had faith in you clearly. Do you find that's typical, or is it is it not typical of of the job? It varies as much as human beings vary one from the other. You know. And is there ever a time where a director says, you know what, Paul, I completely trust you, um, have at it, and, and do what you have to do? Or does a director always kind of in some way have to monitor the process? Well, like I said, everyone's different. You know, right. some people are comfortable having uh, having me drive, and some of them like to take the wheel themselves, you know. So it varies from, from person to person. And, and and I don't want you to retell the story because you've t- told it so many times. But you, you're you got your introduction basically through Brian De Palma and through through mutual acquaintances. You then develop a uh, George Lucas asks asks you to come in, take a look at you know what he's got because he was dealing with editorial issues. Is that kind of the very brief version of your involvement into Star Wars? And and is is that kind of an effective way of putting it? Well, he wanted me to join the team. He didn't ask me to come and take a look or anything. He just uh, what happened was I got a phone call from Marshall Lucas, um, whom I had met a couple of years earlier, and um, Marsha was an editor in her own right. She had done American Graffiti, and Alice, is, Alice doesn't live here anymore, and you know, a very accomplished editor on her own, and uh, she was one of the editors uh, on Star Wars along with Richard Chu, and Richard had worked on the Conversation, and he worked on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you know, so these were uh, you know, heavy hitters, young, young, but you know they had been uh, doing very distinguished work for a while, and um, they had George had let go his original editor when he finished principal photography in England, and um, Richard and Marsha were recutting the film from you know frame one. And given the schedule, they needed help. So Marsha called and asked if I could come on and join the team and help, you know, recut everything in time for the deadline they were operating under. Paul, is that ever in any way overwhelming for you? I mean, that's not to say you're not confident in what you do, but is it? Is it? that's kind of, to me, it would seem like that's an overwhelming thing to be asked to do because, I mean, just because, as you mentioned, there's a lot of heavy hitters there. Did you ever feel that type of pressure? Uh, I guess, uh, you know, you're talking about something that happened 40 some odd years ago, uh, 43 years ago, I guess, you know, it's hard to distinguish in retrospect, whether it was pressure or excitement, you know, uh, I was certainly excited about the idea of working on the film. Um, I didn't doubt my abilities. I had done five pictures by then. And the last picture I had done was Carrie. Right. So um, I felt confident. But then on my very first picture, I felt confident. And that confidence was born out of ignorance. Right. So, uh, <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I, I was excited to work on it. Uh, it was something that I was uh, hoping to do. I had seen some production stills um, while the picture was still shooting. Uh, a friend of mine, Jay Cox, had been over to England and visited the set and came back with all these stills and I saw photographs of the sand crawler and the Jawas and 
the stormtroopers and Darth Vader and C-3PO and R2-D2. And I was just uh, incredibly excited about the prospect of working on the picture. No, that's that's really well said. And, you know, I have to say, you know, w- one of the greatest quotes I think I've ever read came from you. And I, and I hope I have this right. Otherwise, I'll be pretty embarrassed. It said, we thought we were making it for kids. We didn't realize that it would touch the child and everyone. Was that your quote? I did say that, yes. I got to say, you know, I, I would consider myself very involved in the Star Wars universe. That might encapsulate the the whole saga more than any quote I've ever I've ever read. So beautifully put, Paul. I, I've been dying to tell you that. Well, that's flattering. Thank you. Yeah, so I have to say, I, I feel like you were going into like a hostile situation. I don't want to say that, but I feel like George was under a lot of pressure, right? You read about how he thought he had a heart attack. It turned out to be anxiety. You know, I feel like it, it was taking its toll. I, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to be patronizing here, but I feel like you kind of coming in was maybe a little bit of a breath of fresh air for, for George, maybe a, a little bit of a shining light here. I feel like your involvement was... A very very positive thing, Paul. The way I read it, the way I research it, that's what it looks like from the outside. Yeah, that's a complicated statement you made. I would say yes, I was a uh, I was a positive uh, contributor to the process. I can't really say. I don't know how to respond to the first part of what you were saying. You're you know, hinting that. I don't know what you were hinting at. Yeah, no, no, I, no, I, I just think sounded a little negative. No, 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 it wasn't a, a shot at George. I just feel like when you read like what he had to go through, the pressure of just putting this together, it was definitely not negative. It was, it was just it, it, from everything you read, it seems like that George was under the gun. There was a lot of pressure to, you know, just develop this because let's face it, when this movie came out, Paul, people were doubting. It. People were doubting how. You know, it sounded wacky. It was weird. People didn't see the vision George had. George was years and years ahead of his time. And I feel like sometimes, you know, artists, you know, I feel like there was pressure there. I don't I don't think that's a negative thing. I think George had a vision and it was a beautiful vision. And obviously anybody who doubted him was wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's my take on that. You know, and I have to also say, you know, what do, you, what do you think it is about this this entire universe? Because, I mean, you're highly regarded. I mean, does it is it ever overwhelming for you? Does it ever get old when people tell you how much, you know, your work means to them? Let's face it. You know, like Mark Hamill said, movies are made on, on, on the, you know, edit, cutting room floor and the, edit, you know, the editing room. Uh, do you ever, does it ever get old for you or does, is it always, is it always meaningful every time you hear it because i got i know people have interviewed you i know people in the star wars you know universe they all think the world of you um does that must mean the i mean the world to you uh it's very gratifying it doesn't get old no and and i want people that are listening now to know i mean yes you won an academy award for star wars and and you know that's a big part of your life here but you did a lot of other movies and your book and 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 we're going to get to that as well um yeah well you know, the Oscar is a very nice, I mean, it's a, it's a nice thing to have. It's a lovely object. And, um, you know, I, when I was not nominated for Empire Strikes Back, uh, I was disappointed. Uh, you know, I was still a young man. But now, you know, with the wisdom of age, I realize that the awards um, are not what's really important. What matters is the work. And... Uh, even though I wasn't nominated for Empire Strikes Back, I hear from a lot of people that that's their favorite one of all of them. So, um, you know, it, it's, to me, what's more important is that the pictures that I've worked on uh, remain in people's memories. Um, that's what matters more to me, whether they remember whether or not I won an Oscar. The, um, uh, the really uh, insightful statement about this was made to me by Baz Luhrmann when I worked with him briefly on uh, The Great Gatsby. He said to me, you know, it's such a collaborative business and everybody making contributions in their own way to uh, to a film. You know, the, the guy who, uh, who, you know, drives the truck feels like it's his film. You know, everyone who works on it feels like it's their film. And uh, what Baz said was, the greatest thing we can hope for is that the picture we work on becomes part of the culture. Mm. And um, I think uh, I've been lucky in that regard. Many of the pictures that I've worked on uh, are still remembered, even you know decades after they came out. 
No, that is so well said. You know, my dad passed earlier in the year, and the one thing that we really loved and we really bonded with is through Star Wars. And my my entire life, I mean, and, and you mentioned, you know, people in, in, in the. It's Star Wars is almost like a rite of passage. I feel like it's, you know, and that's. I love how you said that. Like I do feel that your work will live on for for as long as these movies are popular, and that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. I just, it's so well said, and I, I just feel like. What do you think it is, Paul? Do you think it's, is it, what's the magic? What do you think it is that, I mean, when Star Wars first came out, I remember Siskel and Ebert, they always had Star Wars back. They said, this is great. You know, people kind of wanted to to, to, to poo-poo this whole idea, this whole storyline. And once it, people took a okay. hold of this, and they went crazy over it. What do you think the magic formula is? or What, what is the secret? Well, you're right. When it, when it opened, some of the you know established movie critics of the day, most of them, many of them, I'd say, you know, uh, had a lot of criticism about the film. They, they said the acting was terrible and the pace was too frenetic, and which is laughable today. You look at it and it seems very placid, you know. Mm. But uh, at the time, um, it was considered, uh, you know, kind of a frenetic pace and. Um, I think the, I think the success couldn't have been anticipated because, in a way, uh, it's had a kind of you know it, other franchises that had more films, like and lasted longer, like the Bond series. You know, they've been making James Bond films. I don't know how many they've made by now. Thirty in the thirties, I suppose. Mm. Maybe even more. Right. You know, and that's lasted fifty years, um, over fifty years. So uh, other franchises have been successful, but there's something different about Star Wars. Uh, I can't quite put my finger on it. Uh, I was asking someone, what is it that characterizes the Star Wars film? It's not the, the actors, because you know there are these three different trilogies that involve different uh, casts. It's not the story of Skywalker, because... Um, you know, or maybe they all are they. I suppose they all about uh, the early films are about Darth Vader, not Skywalker, so much. Um, but uh, you know, what is it? What's the common thread? And I think um, there is the the look of the films, the art direction, the costumes, the stormtrooper outfits, the the robots, the aliens, all have a particular quality. Then there's the whole um, the enormous contribution that John Williams made with his magnificent scores, and also the equally monumental contribution made by Ben Burt creating these sounds that sort of define the universe of Star Wars. The uh, you know the lightsabers and the X-wing sounds and mm. the, uh, robots and R2D2's voice. I mean. A lot of the uh, emotional expressiveness of R2, which is all sort of uh, beeps and electronic sounds, has a human quality where Ben would uh, use his voice to uh, indicate some emotional uh, quality, like, you know, uh, questioning a questioning sound or... A disappointed sound, or and he would do this into a microphone, then alter it electronically to give it R2's voice. So um, the the sound universe that the Star Wars stories operate in um, is very consistent and and distinctive and unique. And the um, but the essential quality of the first film that made it so successful. I mean, I can't, you know, pin it down to one thing, because in a way, the first picture was like every movie you'd ever seen, sort of a chopped salad of all the movies you'd ever seen, and sort of reimagined and thrown together and mixed into a new uh, and fresh version. You know, there's the the, uh, Robin Hood sword fights in the castle, going up and down the stairs, and and uh, Tarzan swing, swinging on a vine, and 
Uh, you had the cowboys in the canyon attacked by Indians on the ridge, <laughs> and the saloon shootout, and the of course the fighter plane battles in the sky. So there are all these different elements of like every movie you'd ever seen um, reimagined by George and f- made fresh. But the key ingredient in all of this, I think, was a very strong moral underpinning where he talks about the force and the idea of good and evil. And um, I don't think it's possible to have an enormously popular movie that isn't based on a very strong moral sense. Um, And because it's not... Uh, specifically religious, and yet it appeals to people in religions all over the world. So there's a kind of a universal quality to the morality that people can interpret through whatever religion they happen to believe in. No, that's um, that's well said. And, and you mentioned The Empire Strikes Back. It's certainly one of the best movies ever made. Never mind sci-fi. I mean, it's one of the best movies ever made. And to harp on your point, uh, Yoda, for me, just does it in so many ways. And we talk about religion. Nobody encapsulates that more than Yoda, I think, Paul. I think he's the perfect, you know, when you talk about religion and spirituality, and I, I think he's as close to that as, as it comes, right? Yeah, well, you know, uh, two things. First of all, it's not sci-fi because George wanted to make it very clear that it was not sci-fi by putting that uh, title at the beginning, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It was meant to say this is not a vision of the future, which is what most space films had been up to that point. That's true, yeah. He didn't want to hear anybody say, you can't hear spaceships in space. You know? <laughs> uh, he wanted sounds for those ships. Anyway, there's that. And also, as far as the spirituality, uh, Irvin Kirshner, who directed Empire Strikes Back, had a great interest in Eastern religion and so forth. So I think some of that made its way into Yoda's character. Yeah, and and I meant to say this earlier, and I don't mean to be bouncing around. You had mentioned your work with Brian De Palma. You were also, I mean, if there's, if anything, Paul, you were asked to do a lot of work. I mean, you were almost getting too much work because you were, I believe, if I'm right here, you were asked for close encounters while you were still working on Carrie, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, I want to make sure I had the right. I meant to say that before when you were talking about, you know, Brian De Palma, and I was like, I, I forgot to bring that up, but that must have been hard to turn it down. Granted, you're working on a, another class of Carrie, but, you know, I mean, you, you eventually get your opportunity, but was that. It's unfortunate that you never worked with Spielberg. Or you, well, not yet, anyway, but it's, I think that would have been a nice pairing. Well, it is one of my only regrets that I never got a chance to work with Stephen. I was I was his tenant for a while. I rented his house, but uh, and he took me to Disneyland along with my family uh, many years ago. But uh, yeah, I would have liked to work with Stephen. But he has a great relationship with Michael Kahn. They've done so many pictures together, and um, I think he's got a new uh, stable that he's bringing along. So I think that sort of opportunity is is gone. But uh, It is one of my regrets. But on the other hand, my consolation for not being able to work on Close Encounters was that I got to work on Star Wars. So that's not so bad. No, that's a that's a pretty good that's a pretty good scenario for you. And that was a big, you know, getting into the New Hope Star Wars. That was a big year of your life. I think that's when you first joined the film. And I think that's your firstborn child that year, too, or close to that year. Yeah, my daughter was born while we were working on the picture. So you have a lot going on at this time. I mean, obviously, you're spending a lot of time in the editing room, but also, you know, personally, you have some stuff going on. So that had to be one of the biggest years of, of, of your life, I would assume. It was a very rich time in my life, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, just going through this, and, and I'm looking at a lot of this, and, you know, you mentioned John Williams, and, and that is so true. And you mentioned the characters, they all work, the Kenner toys. I just feel like I can't think of anything else in my life, Paul, that's been so good for so long. You can maybe make the argument kind of, I guess, that superhero movies are in the ballpark, but I would not say as effective as Star Wars. And that's, to me, it's, and if you, you said this before, it's the legacy and the longevity. And I don't know, I'm just, there's so many words I lack to describe the, the effectiveness of Star Wars. Have you been following the, the series as, as it's been taken by Disney and as it's been going along? Well, I get invited to the premieres and I go, but yeah, I usually just see the pictures once. So um, I can't say that I'm, you know, I don't, of course I have an interest, in, but I'm, I'm not uh, a deep dive fan. You know, I know there's a lot of um, 
there's a whole universe of of uh, Star Wars uh, criticism out there, and all sorts of um, internet sites that discuss this or that or the other thing about Star Wars. Uh, I don't get involved in that, you know. But I I have a sympathy for the series, and um, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, fascinating to see how it has evolved. And it's almost, and I'm glad you said that because, yeah, it almost seems like whether you agree or disagree with the way the story is being told, it's just, I don't know, I feel like the hate on some of those sites and the anger, it's almost like the opposite of what, I'm not going to speak for George, but what the original movies were about. They weren't about hate and what you thought the story should have been. It's it's let people tell the story and, and go along for the ride. I mean, that I don't know, I, I'm a little taken back by a lot of that Star Wars hate. I just... It's almost it's almost like I have to stay off the internet at times, Paul. You know, I, I don't think I realized there was a lot of Star Wars hate, to tell you the truth. It's not necessarily hate. It's disagreement over the way stories should be told, right? So somebody thinks it should have happened this way or it should have happened that way. And, you know, I mean, it's it's. I think you have to let, at one point you just have to let the storytellers do their job. And I don't know, I that that's just my view for whatever that's worth. Well, one of the things I learned in... Uh, in art history was that in the Renaissance um, in Italy, a lot of the artists were commissioned to um, create murals inside the churches. And very often uh, some of these murals would contain saints and they would also contain demons. And the parishioners would sometimes scratch out the demons. They would, def- you know, they would actually... <laughs> to face the murals. Wow! They didn't because they didn't like the the character depicted. Wow! So I think there's some of that going on today with, uh, you know, he should have done this, he should have done that, you know. And, and I think another thing that George did that people he doesn't get enough credit for is he created things that never existed before. Whether it was props, he took pieces of this and pieces of that. Um, amazing, you know, the, the look is amazing. But maybe you can help me with this part, Paul. He did. I don't know if it was specifically George, but was, weren't there things created as far as editing tools and things that were used in the 50s that now they brought back for editing or visual purposes? Am I? Did, did, weren't there other things added to, to, to make Star Wars look the way it did because it looked years and years ahead of its time? Um, I'm not sure what you're... I, I, I'm getting... So, uh, so I might mis, be mispronouncing this. Is it... Moviola or Moviola, it's an editing machine, is that, am I right? Yeah, Moviola was the standard workhorse editing machine for film editors from uh, even before the sound era until, um, I would say, the late 60s, uh, at which point flatbed editing machines came in where the film was mounted like on a reel-to-reel tape recorder. It was hot. Uh, The Moviola worked vertically, there was a reel above and a reel below and the it was like a little mini projector uh projecting the image onto a small um frosted glass screen that the editor would look at and it had an intermittent movement you know film projectors have this uh without getting too technical about it but you know film was composed of still images and the illusion of motion comes from a psychological phenomenon called the phi factor in which when you see an object in one place and then you see it in another place you interpret that as having moved from the first place to the second place so the brain see understands it that way right so um the film is based on this concept and these still images that succeed one another, they move the image slightly each time. But in order for the image to be perceived, it has to be, uh, it has to hold still in front of the gate uh, through which the light is projected so that you can register it. Otherwise, it would just be a blur of film going by. So there was this intermittent movement that would come into place, hold for a, se- for a brief and less than a second, of course. This is all, each frame is four one hundredths of a second. So this frame would come up momentarily and hold still, and then it would move up, and the next one would hold still momentarily, and so forth. So this uh, um, intermittent movement 
is perceived as motion due to the phi factor. I've lost the thread of where I was going with this, but um, no, and, and what, I, what I was yeah, and you're, thank you for that because yeah, I, I thought I read where maybe it was that all right, moviola. Yes, right. yes. So, so the moviola was a, like a little mini projector, and it was originally invented to uh, to be a home viewing device. Uh, there had been a record player that was sold at the beginning of the century, the 20th century, called the Victrola. It was made by RCA Victor. And the Victrola became a name sort of like Kleenex or uh, Google. You know, the, right. the, the brand name became the name of the object. And uh, the Victrola was, was widely adopted in homes all over the country and maybe all over the world. And they invented the Moviola to be something similar, but it didn't catch on. So even though it didn't catch on, it did catch on with, with editors and professional editors and that became the workhorse for 50 years or 60 years. And um, that's what editors cut on for the longest time. Yeah, and one of them, and, and I, I thought I read this, where one of the two you mentioned was was brought back for Star Wars and they had to build it almost from scratch because there weren't many around. Do I have that right? Well, Star Wars, the visual effects were shot in VistaVision, which was a format that the studios had come up with when TV started making inroads against their business. And their response to the ubiquity of television in every home was to make the theatrical experience more magnificent and grand. And they started shooting in VistaVision, which was uh, a larger um, frame and a resulting uh, sharper image. So they had a big screen with a very sharp image and uh, compared to TV, which was black and white and blurry in those days. But the thing about VistaVision was that it used twice as much film, um, you know, in 10 minutes of, of 35 millimeter would be 1,000 feet, let's say, or 900 feet. And VistaVision would be – um, it would be that, – that – number of that that amount of footage would be half the time so 900 feet in 35 would be 10 minutes in VistaVision would be uh, five minutes wow so it was more expensive you had to print more and print was costly and then just for the editors to work on you had to make a reduction print where you had to change the VistaVision format back back to standard 35 millimeter and uh so it had been in fashion for a while but then it was abandoned and um george was concerned about the quality of the visual effects uh, sticking out from the original 35 negative that the film was shot in he was afraid that the uh, effects would be uh of poorer quality poorer visual quality less sharp and and so he decided to use VistaVision so that when there was an inevitable loss of quality, because it was starting so much better, it would result in something that matched the original 35 uh, negative that was used for everything else in the film. So yeah. um, they, they needed to build uh, optical printers and optical benches to handle the VistaVision because there was no such thing. So the guys at ILM actually had to actually build these things. Yeah, you you effectively explained what I what I could not. Yes, that's that's what I was referencing, and and it, and it makes a world of difference in the final copy. And you know, two of the bigger scenes that you edited, one was when um, Uncle Owen goes to buy the droids, Obi Wan in the cave. Talk about that a little bit, Paul. Those are huge scenes. I mean, um, it, when you watch a final product, so let's just take those two scenes in particular. Do you ever watch a movie? And I don't want to say second guess yourself, but do you ever say to yourself, "Ah, uh, probably should have left this in or kept that out." Do you ever wonder to yourself, or are you always kind of pleased with what's up on the screen? I don't watch my old movies. Oh, okay. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. Uh, by the time I get finished working on a movie, I never want to see it again. <laughs> you spend so much time, I would imagine, in the editing room that I, I exactly. can't believe. Really... Exactly. You watch the same footage so many times over and over, you literally do not want to ever see it again. And, uh, you know, as a, as a professional editor... You get another job, you move on to the next. There's no reason to go back and look at your old pictures. 
So, uh, no, I have no feelings about I should have done this, should have done that. I mean, um, the only regret I have has to do with Mission Impossible mm. because people found it confusing. And I, I think that the whole confusion rests on um, a single line. I could be wrong, but my, you know, I have a feeling that a lot of people didn't understand Tom Cruise when he's said he's in a restaurant in Prague and he's meeting with his CIA contact or Mission Impossible IMF contact, whatever they call him. And uh, he says this whole thing was a mole hunt. <laughs> and I think I think it's it doesn't land somehow. This whole thing was a mole hunt. And maybe we could have looped it to make it clearer or something. I I think that was the the point of the, of confusion. Although you know, I've I met a lot of ten year olds who could follow the picture just fine. You know, but the the uh, the press got this idea that it was a confusing movie. Oh, it's very confusing. It's very confusing. And uh, the second week grosses dropped precipitously from the first week. It opened huge, but then it dropped an enormous amount and. Um, the studio, uh, even though it made almost two hundred million dollars, which in you know nineteen ninety five was uh, a huge sum, huge. Um, they were disappointed that it, you know it only got to one hundred and ninety or something. It didn't didn't get to two hundred. I thought, how can you be disappointed in in that result? You know, but um, that's the only one that comes to mind of something I wish we had. Well, another one of your movies, not not along the lines of of any type of regret or anything, but I, that I really feel is almost underappreciated with source code. I really love source code, Paul. I thought that was one of the best movies that no one really, I mean, it did well, but people don't talk about it as much as they should. I thought that was a really visually stunning movie. I thought it was really well done. Yeah, I agree. I thought Duncan Jones did a great job. Yeah. And you know, there was edits in star Wars, I think in 97, 2004, 2011, do you have a part in those or is that up to other people or are you, are you completely done with star Wars at that point? Uh, nothing to do with them. Okay, okay, yeah. And um, uh, when you first, and I wanted to ask you this, when you first were brought on to Star Wars, you stayed at the Chateau Mormont, which is the, which is where Belushi ended up passing. Um, Brief, briefly. Briefly, briefly. And, you know, wh- why is that so, I mean, it, for those listening, and I mean, that's, pr- that's a pretty, uh, th- that... Pl- that establishment in itself is, is well known. Um, is that kind of where you, I mean, you've been in the business for a while at that point, but I mean, did you feel kind of, that's a pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty good place to stay. I have to say, I mean, that's pretty well known throughout history, basically for who's been there and, and the history it has behind it. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was, I don't know. It's just seemed a logical place to stay. I was, uh, in LA and, you know, New Yorkers, if you ask people in New York, where should I stay in LA? They'd say, Oh, the Chateau, you know, stay at the Chateau. So it's just sort of following, uh, what people had recommended to me. And the one thing that I think your career has, Paul, that I feel like, you know, people could ask you all they want, you know, what's the secret? What should I do? I want to be an editor, but I got to say, I mean, I think an editor, I feel like, because you're always reinventing yourself. The way you edited a movie in 1977 is certainly not the same way you're editing a movie in 2011. You keep reinventing yourself, and I feel like that's what all, whether it's a great athlete, a great director, a great actor, a great editor, you have to keep reinventing yourself and, and, and keeping up with that work ethic. I, you know, I know you're asked on occasion, and people, you know, what's the, you know, what, what do I do? How do I? I, I feel like a lot of it is is within the person themselves. Like it's within you to keep reinventing yourself and always kind of keeping, you know, an eye on what the newest technology, what the newest thing is. So I feel like what's most impressive about you is that you've been so effective for so long. I feel like that's really hard to do no matter what your profession is. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, just getting into your, your book here. Um, I'm going to make it simple. What, what made you decide to write a book? I mean, I, it, it's a phenomenal book. I'm excited. I, it comes tomorrow. I'm very, you know, I read excerpts on it. I read some beautiful things said by Brian De Palma. You know, we mentioned Mark Hamill. Talk a little about your book. I mean, it's the, 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 the cover alone makes me want to read it because I'm just, a history buff. Talk a little bit about your book. Well, um, the idea started uh, when I was in on location in Vancouver in 1999, and my wife Jane had stayed home in LA, 
Um, and it was a weekend and I was bored and I was alone and I thought, well, you know, I had been telling these stories, you know, you go visit the set and you hang out and you chit chat with people hanging around and, uh, I would tell these stories and some of them had, you know, gotten to, you know, pretty good reactions. And I thought, you know, I should really write these stories down while I still remember them. And, uh, that's what I started to do. And then, uh, I, I wrote one chapter and then I thought, you know, I'll, I'll just make an outline, which is a very smart thing to do because, um, if I tried to write the book starting today, I wouldn't remember, uh, you know, uh, very much of what I could remember 20 years ago. So, um, I made this outline and then as the, I would work on the book from, you know, chip away at it and then I work on it when I was not working and sometimes I would drop it for two or three years at a time if I got busy and then I'd go back to it during a period of unemployment. And, um, I would add to it if there, you know, if I lived through some event that was interesting enough to, uh, to write about. And, um, I finally finished the first draft in 2017 and, um, showed it to my friend, Nick Meyer, who gave it his first read. And then, he recommended me to his literary agent and then um, went through a, an editing process, started editing the book in something like um, February or March of 2018 and finished in June of 2019. So I was editing it for about 16 months, again, wow. with, some time, again with some time off. But, um, you know, it's like, it's a very familiar process. It was like when you work on a film, you, you do a version for the director, and then when he's satisfied, it gets, you know, shown to the producer, and then you have to make changes to accommodate the producer, and then they show it to the studio, and then the studio wants to make changes. And so uh, you go through a round of, of criticism, and um, um, that's sort of what happened with, with the book, you know, uh, the uh, the agents had some notes and I accommodated them to the degree that I felt comfortable with, and then it goes to the publisher and the publisher has notes and you know you go through the same process. So um, um, yeah, it's it was a lot of work, very enjoyable work I have to say. Uh, in this case, I was the uh, writer, director, producer. You know, <laughs> yeah, you're so, the jack of all trades there. So I was I was not. Uh, subordinate to anyone else on this one do you find when you do something like that I, I don't want to use the word therapeutic but do you find the memories come kind of flooding back because i mean you have years invested in this book i mean never mind the editing part of it which like you mentioned was was also you know multiple i mean it's so much time but do you find that when you actually have time to think and to write down and to kind of you know just ponder what you want to put down on paper i have to imagine it's it's it becomes more than just I hate to say more than just a book, but, but it's it becomes something else, doesn't it? For you, it's something very special to you. Well, it's my only, it's my one and only book. You know, they say everybody has one book in them, and this is it. Yeah. This is for me, uh, unless I live another fifty years and and have another fifty year career. You know, but I don't think that's likely. Uh, let me ask you, and we, I touched on this earlier. Why is why is Brian De Palma so special to you? Why was he? You know, I know you many times you referred to him as your mentor. Why why was he so influential to you? Well, he gave me five pictures to cut before anyone else would hire me. Wow! Uh, so, you know, and uh, he and I uh, had a wonderful close relationship, and he is a very special director in terms of his. Uh, vision of telling uh, stories through visual means and not using the camera simply to record uh, actors speaking dialogue. But he had, he was interested in the plastic uh, dimensions of the medium and using camera movement and editing uh, to to tell his story so that you you could have. Uh, Sequences like in Carrie, the prom scene, has hundreds and hundreds of setups that are shot very specifically uh, to to function in a certain way, and um, it's very different from um, the the practice of coverage, 
where the same action is photographed uh, again and again from different angles. Um, Brian had a vision that, uh, like I say, is unique. He was influenced by Hitchcock, but he, he took it to another level, you know, and uh, um, he, he, he had confidence in me, he gave me a lot of autonomy, although he kept control, of course, and um, he validated my work, he encouraged me, he uh, supported my vision a lot of the time, and um, he was very important in my development as a young editor. Yeah, and professionally, you touched on a lot of what makes him great, and, and you also what makes him a great human being, and I can definitely see both sides of that. And, you know, I, I can't let you go just yet without asking you about John Hughes. I mean, my gosh, a good majority of your career is spent with the, perhaps the three, one, three greatest directors of all time, John Hughes, Brian De Palma, George Lucas. Talk a little bit about John Hughes, if you would, Paul. Well, John was an eccentric genius. Um, he was extremely uh, funny and he had a way of seeing the world that was unique and he had a gift for um, inspiration uh, he, he came to the mix of Ferris Bueller's Day Off one morning and handed me an envelope and I said what, what is this? He says read it, I wrote it last night and I pulled it out and it was the first 60 pages of Planes, Trains and Automobiles and he had written it in one sitting. Wow. It was the first hour of the film uh, he had written all in one go the night before. He had been writing, you know, something like, uh, it was either 10 pages an hour for six hours or six pages an hour for 10 hours, I forget which. But, um, yeah, he, he was just, um, he would sort of go into a trance and he would write the, and it never changed. That, those 60 pages that he wrote in one sitting are what was shot. And, um, you know, he's, he's quite remarkable in that way. It's really a shame that he died so young. Um, there's going to be a retrospective screening of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles in Chicago at the Music Box Theater on November 20th. And I'll be there with John's son, James to present the film and talk about it. And, and I was just going to ask you about that. And, and is it true? Is it going to be the four hour original version or is it going to be the, the one that we all know that we've seen? No, it's going to be the, the cut that, you know, this is funny notion that, you know, that the longer cut is better. Well, if the longer cut was better, we would have put it out. Right, you know? right, <laughs> right. No, I agree. I agree. It, it, yeah, because I, I was doing. I was, I was gonna before I let you go. I was gonna say, you know, I know that you and James are getting together in Chicago on the twentieth for a yeah. screening. Is is that a Q and A kind of format too, Paul? I, I believe so. Yeah. So, so I mean, that's got to be a, a kind of a great experience. You're watching the film that you help kind of create, and you know, with with James, obviously, uh, that's a huge thing, and. You know, you get to interact with the fans. I mean, that's that's a phenomenal experience for those who are lucky enough to attend on the on the twentieth. Well, I hope it is for them. I, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, you know, the thing about comedy is it's great to see them with a with a, uh, a full house, and I'm sure because it's a special occasion that we'll probably get a pretty good crowd there. Um, on the occasion of John's death, there were uh, screenings of Ferris and planes, trains, and automobiles here in Los Angeles. And I got a chance to see uh, those pictures for the first time in, you know, 25, 30 years, whatever it was, and with an audience. And they, they're really wonderful pictures. Is yeah. there any – and, Paul, when, when you when you do all this editing and, and over the years as, as, th as things accumulate, have you ever seen something that is so – whether it's an actor's performance or – that, that has kind of blown you away that you think about? Is, is there been one thing in, I mean, you've done so much editing, you, know, you spend hours and hours in these rooms and these movies, but has there been one moment or a scene that you remember that you kind of think about every now and then that, that you're so taken back or blown away by? Um, look, I've been very fortunate to work on a lot of different great things, you know, so um, I can't, you know, to single out a single moment is kind of beyond my ability. Well, I do want to say, you know, thank you for everything you've done. I mean, for fans everywhere, I know you're so appreciated. And, and seriously, Paul, thank you for all of it. 
Uh, for those of you listening, uh, Paul's book, A Long, Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away, My 50 Years. Actually, actually it's a long time ago. Oh, and I'm saying a long, long time ago. Jesus. And yeah. I got, yeah, but the book is, is available, I think, everywhere, right? Even, you know, uh, everywhere books are sold because I was looking today online. It's Amazon. It's, you know, iTunes. It's everywhere. A long time ago in a cutting room far, far away. And there's an audio version of it on Audible as well. Uh, it's available on Kindle, and you can get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, regular brick-and-mortar bookstores, uh, the Chicago Review Press website. You can buy it there as well. Um, yeah, it's out there. Uh, any type of tour plan, Paul, where you know, I also as authors read a little passage or an excerpt from the book, did any of that planned? Yeah, I'm going to be appearing in a couple of places in um, in Los Angeles. Um, I'm doing an appearance at a place called a store called Book Monster on uh, November 15th at 2 p.m. Uh, Book Monster is in Santa Monica, and I'm also going to be appearing at uh, a convention at the Los Angeles Airport Marriott. On November 29th, I believe it's 6.30, uh, a convention called LOSCON, L-O-S-C-O-N. And I'll be on a panel uh, with, um, a, a, I think it's a program called Skywalking Through Neverland. And uh, there'll be some more as well. The Egyptian Theater is planning something on December 7th, I believe, where I'll be appearing to talk about a couple of the Palma pictures that they're going to show. And, uh, yeah, I have things scheduled here, there, and I'm sure more will come up in the uh, intervening weeks. No, the book has been really, really well received. Uh, just reading thoughts and what people were saying about it, it, it really hits home with a lot of people. So I, I wish you nothing but success, and, uh, you know, you've earned it, and, and we're very fortunate to be able to read some of your life story. Oh, well, thank you very much.